Hello all, I'm Rosie Vision, and I'm setting out on a mission to bring animated shows aimed towards a mostly female audience that aren't really talked about that much under a rose-colored spotlight. I may be late to the party, but I finally got around to watching season 8 of Winx Club. I've been a fan of Winx Club for over a decade now, but like a lot of old school fans, I had huge reservations about giving this season a chance. When the teaser for the season came out a few years ago, I was pretty taken back by the shift in art style, but I was still willing to give it a go. That is, until the full trailer came out. I don't know how many people can relate, but seeing Obscurum, Valtor's sidekick, and the new design for the specialist kind of killed any excitement or hope I was holding on to for the season. It was painfully obvious that Rainbow had decided to cater towards a much younger audience than it had started with. This was already apparent with previous seasons, especially season 7 in particular, but seeing the Winx depicted as much younger was the final nail in the coffin for me. When I first realized this change in direction for Winx Club, I was really confused and honestly kind of hurt. However, after stepping back for a few years, I can understand why Rainbow did what they did. Does it make the change any more bearable? Not really, but after giving Season 8 a chance, I was quite surprised. In some ways, it was everything I feared it was going to be, and heaven forbid, more. I could feel my soul leaving my body more and more with each episode at the start. But, but, but... I actually found myself enjoying some things, especially more so in the second half of the season. And that is what brings me here. I would like to give my honest and unfiltered thoughts on Season 8 of Winx Club. We're gonna look at it all. The good, the bad, and plenty of ugly to go around. I'd also like to defend Rainbow a bit. I have no idea what the company's business practices are or how they treat their employees and fans behind closed doors. However, I do think that they had a good reason for the changes they made. And Season 8 felt sort of like they were trying to target both younger audiences as well as older fans. Probably part of the reason why it didn't take off too well. Well, I think that's enough rambling for now. Here's a quick synopsis of the season. One day at Althea, the Winx are surprised by what they think is a shooting star. Turns out that the star is actually a lumen, named Twinkly. Lumens are like the light equivalent of pixies in this season. Lumens are found all over the universe and protect light-fueled cores that power stars. These cores are what keeps stars and surrounding planets from being dark, icy wastelands. Turns out that Valtor is back and is scheming to take the power of light found within these cores for himself so he can become even more powerful. Together with Twinkly, the Winx protects stars across a magic dimension from Valtor and his minions. This is basically the first half of Season 1. After that, things take a turn and change quite a bit. I'll start by discussing this part of the season on its own. First for the stuff that I didn't like. There's a lot that I didn't care for in this first part of the season. For starters, it feels really out of place, almost like it's in its own universe. This is due to the fact that Rainbow intended to soft reboot the series for younger audiences. But the sudden shift is kind of jarring considering that this isn't a spin-off. Not only do the Winks look way younger, but now they're back in school? I know why this was done. Rainbow did this so that younger audiences could relate to the characters more. But it's never really explained why they're back in school. There's other things as well, but that's the most noticeable for me. It may seem like a nitpick, especially since writers were trying to take Winx Club in a new direction, but the weird canonical inconsistencies makes the season feel slightly off, and in a really uncanny Twilight Zone way. That's the least of the season's worries, however. Easily the biggest issue that I have with this half of the show would be the villains. Valtor and Obscurum. Valtor uses Obscurum as a minion, similar to how he treated the tricks in Season 3. So far, quite on brand for him. However, other than that, Valtor does not feel the same at all. He mostly just sits in a chair all day and isn't really frightening in the least. 
He's just sitting there menacingly. This is the same guy who destroyed Stella's home life and blinded Aisha in an instant. But it doesn't really feel that way, especially because of Obscurum. Obscurum was definitely a comic relief add-in for kids to keep them entertained and make sure things never feel too serious. And it shows. Every moment that Obscurum was on screen, I wanted to pull my hair out. The same could be said for the Star Yummies. Even the name itself is quite childish. And like Obscurum, the Star Yummy's main purpose, other than being a mild annoyance to the Winx, is as comic relief and to help keep kids' attention on screen. The villains really brought down the first half of the show for me, and by a lot. And this was due to Rainbow deciding to skew towards a younger audience, and that's a shame, because I've been forced to sit through my fair share of programming for the age demographic they targeted, thanks to my youngest sister. And yes, a lot of shows aimed towards a younger audience are just as mind-numbing and annoying at times, but there's still some I've sat through that I had a lot more fun watching that actually takes their audiences more seriously when it comes to stakes and overall mood. The other thing that makes this season unbearable for me would be the specialist. This new art style does not do them any favors. I actually kind of grew to like the art style in the Winx a bit, more on that later, but I can never get used to the way the specialist looked. It's a mixture of proportions not being able to decide how old they should look, and the new uniform. First, let's talk about the proportions. Their eyes are pretty uncomfortably large, almost as large as the Winx. Usually in a lot of stylized art, like anime, which Winx Club is inspired by, male characters have significantly smaller eyes than female characters. This creates more variation between designs and can be used to show the age of characters. Obviously, Rainbow was trying to make specialists look younger. And if you look at their eyes, and how short their legs are compared to the rest of their body, they succeeded. But their overall looks and silhouettes still make them look like older teenagers somehow. Like in some shots, I could have sworn they went back to the original style. I don't know how they managed to make the specialists look simultaneously 10 and 16 years old, but they found a way. And now for the uniform change. I can see what they're going for. But it doesn't look good. At all. They tried to make the specialists look more like superheroes kids are familiar with today. So their uniform basically became like a budget Iron Man suit. But there is a random chin piece that bugs me so much, even though they don't really use helmets most of the time. And the uniform is uncomfortably skin tight looking. It makes you notice their short legs more. And... I was graced with a not very pleasant view every single time they would turn their backs. My eye! I don't think many fans would complain about the specialist wearing something that reveals their entire figure under normal circumstances. You know, if they didn't look 10 and 16 at the same time, somehow. And if they wore something that wouldn't give the fashion police a heart attack. I couldn't tell you why, but I actually liked Orion's character design, which used the same style. Having a halfway decent fitting is probably part of it. <sighs> I had a section of script after this saying that Rainbow actually put in way more effort for Orion's design than the specialists. Yep, I was about to pat Rainbow on the back, until I realized that I was quite wrong. Apparently, Orion's design is taken directly from an indie game called Shardband, and I think it's pretty obvious that, for whatever reason, the design was stolen, rather than using as reference as it should have been, if anything. So, that's a real bummer. I really liked the look, but it looks like I have indie game developers to thank for that, rather than the Rainbow Team. Back to the specialists. It's not just their look that irks me greatly. The voice casting does them no favors either in English. Apparently it's the same cast as season 7. That's all kind of a blur for me, honestly, so I don't remember if I liked the cast back then. 
but the voices really don't fit for this new style. I'm not trying to bring down the voice actors here. Work is work, and I'm sure they've done better things before. And if not yet, then they definitely will someday. But the casting choices themselves are rather poor. Younger sounding voices would probably be better for this season. But that is not the direction that was taken. Nothing. But today's mission reminded me of our mission on planet Hypsos. Or when we destroyed the Opal Dragon. Neither of them. I was rather thinking about the landing. Brandon and Nex were by far the most egregious of miscast voices. I cannot take them seriously one bit every single time they were on screen. Their voices were so gruff and gravelly that they sounded like they were big and burly men. And as you can see, that is not what the characters look like at all. And it really takes you out of it. Every time Brandon was on screen, I would either start bursting out in laughter or groaning in pain. The other voices, Skye, Timmy, Helia, and Riven, more on him later, aren't as distractingly bad, but I feel like a new cast could have helped their likability quite a bit. Well, it's later. Since I just name-dropped him, now on to Riven. I have very conflicting feelings on his character in general, and this season just made that ten times worse. I've always had a soft spot for the guy. Because despite his rough exterior, you could always tell that his heart was in the right place. Sadly, that kind of went down the drain in season 6 when they decided to remove him from the show. Words cannot describe how upset I was when that first happened. I could honestly see Musa and Riven not working out. They've always had rocky moments, and it's obvious that Musa has been hurt by him on many occasions. To the point where she doesn't fully trust him anymore. I understand that. That makes sense. It's not a happy truth, but it is still the truth. You can like someone as a person and still see the good in them, but have a romantic relationship not work out. However, before his departure, Riven was acting pretty out of character in my opinion. He's always been a bit insensitive at times and someone who can get defensive, but they bumped that up to 11 in season 6. And this was AFTER he grew as a character, thanks to Musa and his friends. One of which he was incredibly close to, who brought out the best in him, and, you know, was killed just a few years prior. I think it was a missed opportunity not making Riven's outburst a result of his grief over Nabu. It only makes sense, and is something that he could get over, even if he needed to take a break from Musa. But no. What made me more mad than that was the fact that he was kicked off the show. His whole life as a specialist at Red Fountain, his dreams and aspirations, and his friends were all taken from him. Just because of a breakup? It would have made more sense for him to maybe be assigned to a different team so he doesn't have to bump into the wings as often, but it makes no logical sense for things to take this kind of a turn. Obviously the writers were trying to figure out a way to write him off the show, but it didn't really make sense or do the character justice at all. And after all that, years later, Riven is back. Out of the blue. I really wish they took this chance to explain what he was up to all this time. But all season 8 gives us is that he's changed, and all better, magically, out of nowhere. And Misa gets upset that he didn't contact her at all while he was gone, even though she broke up with him and they mutually decided to part ways. This just makes Musa and Riven look so shallow and one-dimensional, and it's kind of a slap in the face to people who wanted Riven to come back in the first place. I really wish they spent more time developing his return. There was so much potential. Minus this aspect, I actually don't mind his character in this season. True to his word, he has changed for the better. And there are some sweet moments between him and Musa. But it doesn't feel like Riven at all. He doesn't make quips at all. Obviously, he can't go around insulting people anymore, but he was very sarcastic in nature before. You can still be likable while being sarcastic, but his humor is completely gone. And he doesn't seem like he's super close with the specialists either. They've been through a lot together, yet in general, the specialists just don't seem like friends anymore. 
that's actually most of what I didn't like for the most part. There are other things, but they're a lot more minor and of less consequence. I'll just speed run through the other things I wasn't the biggest fan of, and then we'll move on to things I actually liked. Now let's start off the speed run of things I don't like with the concerts. Wings in Concert is nothing new, but the transformation type thing for instruments is new as far as I can remember. I don't know anymore. My memory isn't as good as it used to be. Let me know if this is new, please. I'm assuming this instrument-based transformation sequence was made to push toys, but these sequences definitely dragged on and were repeated way too many times. Also, mini rant incoming, by the way, the instruments. Wings Club has never been super musically accurate, but as a musician, there were some things that really bugged me this season. First off, the Winx switched instruments. Musa is on guitar now instead of lead guitar. And in my opinion, lead guitar fits the fairy music much more in my opinion. I actually liked that they put techno and synth, but back to Musa. For some reason, Musa plays her guitar like a regular guitar. For those who don't know, a guitar is essentially just a keyboard you can swing onto your shoulders, like a guitar, and it tends to have a synth-like sound so you don't need to move your fingers across the fretboard to change pitch. You just press the keys. Yet Musa, the fairy of music people, plays it incorrectly. Also, the guitars the Winx play have no strings. I'm sure this was just done to make it easier for animators, but jeez, the Winx must really be magical if they can play string instruments without strings. Also, I think they switched Flora to electric guitar. She plays her instrument like a guitar, and it looks the same as Stella's guitar, but that leaves no one on bass, even though you can very clearly hear bass in their songs. Someone has a vendetta against bass players, apparently, at Rainbow. Justice for bass, I say. But in all seriousness, I think bass really suited Flora. Its sound is a lot less in your face frequency-wise compared to guitar. Bass isn't in the spotlight as often. It has a mellower sound that's more easy on the ears. And it serves as a glue that makes everything feel right. Kind of similar to Flora, am I right? <laughs> Small nitpick, but I can't be the only one that misses Flora on bass. Let me know if you agree. I need to know that I'm not alone. Oh, and I almost forgot. Back to music again. She doesn't sing at all this season, even as a fairy of music. Flora sings more than she does for crying out loud. Turn all around, then turn once again. The door of nature will open for a friend. Like most people, I think it'd make the most sense for Musa to cover lead vocals. But I was willing to accept her as a backup vocalist, considering Bloom doesn't play any instruments and Musa does. It's a cop-out, I know. But it makes more sense than having only Bloom sing. And for the last thing I'll complain about for the time being, one word. Emojix. Once again, it is quite clear Rainbow was trying to grab onto younger audiences with this gimmick. Emojix. God, I wish it had a different name is essentially blank told by emoji format. There is way too much of it throughout the series, and it doesn't seem like an effective way to communicate at all. It's literally just there to keep kids' attention, and that's it. Oh, there was a marketing push by Rainbow to create official Winx Club stickers based off of these emojis. The stickers are cute, I'll give them that, but I had to go out of my way to find them. Granted, I don't use stickers, so I'm not familiar with the system, but... You'd think that Rainbow would link the stickers onto the Winx site or on the new episodes or something, if their whole intent was to get people to download them. Okay, enough complaining for now. Now onto the things I actually liked. Easily the best part of the show would be the Winx themselves. Even though they look younger, the character of each individual Winx still shines through. By far, I enjoyed the series the most whenever it was just the Winx on screen. Granted, there were still some moments that didn't quite work, like some failed jokes, visual eye candy scenes for kids, 
or ideas that just weren't nearly as cool as the writers probably initially thought they were. But to be honest, the original show, even back in early seasons, does the exact same thing. What I probably liked the most about the Winx this season is that it felt like each member was given room to grow and time to shine. Bloom has to deal with insecurities she feels towards her relationship with Skye. Musa has trouble trusting Riven again. Stella is still dealing with her parents' separation. Aisha is afraid of disappointing her parents and leaning on others. And Flora gets frustrated when her ideas get turned over and has to learn to let Mia Lay stand on her own. Tecna probably has the least growth of the bunch, sadly, but she still gets time to shine. She's still a great problem solver. She geeks out over gadgets made by Orion. She gets her own special attack. And she learns to balance logic with impulse through Aisha's spontaneity. The Winks were definitely in their element. Each one brought something to the table, and no one ever felt overlooked throughout the season. It honestly reminded me why I liked Winx Club so much in the first place. They're a group of friends who are as different as can be that come together to save the universe. And I totally got that here. These were the Winx that I grew up loving. Bloom was kind of emotional and a hothead. Flora was more cautious and thoughtful. Stella still can't read a room to save her life, and she cracks jokes left and right. Aisha is a strong personality learning how to fight through her own insecurities. Tecna is as dependable as ever and still a bit of a geek at times. And Misa is rather sensitive but still very devoted to those she cares about. All in all, my favorite part of the season hands down. Now for music! Yay! I do miss Elisa Roselli. She's the heart of Winx Club in a way. She did perform most of the songs for over 10 years after all. And from what I've seen, she does seem to really enjoy her work on the series. A true legend within the Winx universe for sure. That said, Alessia Orlando, who sings the insert songs, has been working for a Winx Club for a few years now. And I'm glad that they at least kept her on rather than hire someone completely new. Her voice has grown on me over the years. I don't really have any complaints with the music this season. It still has that Winx touch to it, and I liked each song well enough. The only real nitpick I'd have is that none of the songs really stand out to me besides the opening, ending, and the cosmic song, which I all really enjoy. There's always at least one or two insert songs I usually end up falling in love with each season, but I didn't really feel that here but I still like the sound overall. It fits the series well. What would Winx Club be without the fashion? I'm not going to pretend that I know anything about fashion, but it's still something I have an interest for. And shows like Winx Club are a part of the reason why. I'm not going to break down each look because not only am I not qualified, but that would take forever. However, there are tons of new looks throughout the series and you can tell that the character designers are trying to keep up with the modern day. Not every look is a success, but I think the Winx looks great the majority of the time overall. Besides, let's not pretend the Winx didn't have overly ambitious looks in the past. I really like the casual look that everyone was given this season, though I think the color and pattern choices were a bit too chaotic for Tecna. Stella looks great in purple, in my opinion. I'm glad they changed it up a bit. It fits her original powers of the sun and moon well. The concert attire the Winx have this season is a pretty loud fashion statement, as the Winx Club tends to do often. I really like certain aspects of it, though. For example, I love the music-themed skirts Bloom and Flora wear. The treble clef on Bloom's skirt was my personal favorite creative touch. Stella's braided, updone hair looks great, and Musa's outfit, though a bit chaotic, fits her rebel rocker spirit perfectly. Wish they got rid of the blueprint on her sweater, though. It would bring everything together more cohesively. And now for the transformations. There is plenty to look forward to transformation-wise this season. The Winx earn cosmics, but also occasionally use Enchantix and Cyrenix. There's even a Lovix sort of add-on to Cyrenix called Crystal Cyrenix. 
I knew I'd love seeing Enchantix again, but I cannot tell you how surprised I was by how much I missed Cyrenix. The second I heard the Cyrenix transformation music, I was slapped across the face with nostalgia. I always liked Cyrenix, but I thought that the CG animation and even the seemingly rushed 2D version brought down the quality a lot. So it was nice to finally see the transformation without the CG and with consistent proportions. Apparently the new Enchantix was a bit of a hot topic. I personally didn't notice a difference until I looked at the stills. I for sure prefer the original look and the transformation sequence 100%. But I'm not gonna lie, I'm just happy they brought it back. As for the season's original transformation, Cosmics, I really like the look of it. The Winks may look like they dive-bombed into a pool of glitter, but considering the galaxy theme of this season, it works. It's not my number one Winx transformation, but I'd probably put it in my top five favorites currently. It's a solid look in my opinion. However, that being said, I think the transformation itself was rather lackluster. Granted, most Winx transformations have been like that for quite a while. There aren't unique transformation sequences for each fairy, and usually each member just spins around for a few seconds. But it was clear that this season's transformation sequence was just most magical girl transformations regurgitated with the Winx skin spray painted on. It's pretty similar to Sailor Moon. I know that you could argue that this was meant to be a nod to the magical girl genre, but there's really nothing new brought to the table. It just feels like recycled material, which is a real shame. Enchantix and Believix did a really good job at creating unique transformation sequences that fit each fairy perfectly. I hope that in the future, we can see more transformations like that again. Though I'm not too happy with the transformation sequence, I can't say the same for how magic was used this season. The past few seasons before this really simplified the magic system down, to the point that it felt like each fairy just pointed color-coded laser beams at enemies and not much else. So I was surprised to see that magic seemed to work more similarly to earlier seasons. Musa uses sand waves to shake the earth and Bloom's iconic fiery dragon makes a comeback. Also, Aisha is using Morphix again, and in creative ways too. Using Morphix, Aisha creates a bubble to breathe in one episode, and as a shield which doesn't conduct electricity to defend against Stormy in another. She also uses Morphix to lasso onto an item from far away, so a major step in the right direction. I hope magic continues to be used more creatively in the future. Next topic, the tricks. I was pleasantly surprised by the return of the tricks. Personally, I've been annoyed by the writers bringing them back over and over and over again. But this time, I'm glad they did. And it actually sorta of made sense why the tricks returned this time. Valtor, who we know is extremely powerful and has worked with the tricks in the past, pulls them out of their prison in limbo, but he places his mark on them so that they don't have any choice but to obey him, otherwise he'll send them back. So it actually makes sense why the tricks work for him, and they don't repeat their past mistakes either. They don't trust Valdor because of what happened last time, and are only working with him to earn their freedom once more. Bringing the tricks back is what saved the season for me personally. I don't think I could have finished it if Obscurum was one of the main baddies the entire time. The tricks are the good old evil witches that we've come to know and love over the years. Not as intimidating as the first season, but their personalities remain intact, and they actually get moments to shine individually. Darcy shows off her wit and great skill with deception. Stormy is boastful to a fault, and not only does Icy learn from past mistakes, but we get to see a new side of her as well. Another great thing about the tricks coming back is that they were actually shown to be at the same level, magic, and street smart wise as the Winx. Things felt pretty well balanced between the two groups. The tricks were able to keep up with the Winx and even beat them on multiple occasions. This made their battles fun to watch, and it actually felt like the Winx weren't untouchable. I also really liked that we got to see that the tricks, although malevolent and selfish at times, 
actually do care for each other in their own way. I feel like that made them more interesting as a foil to the Winx. It showed that the two groups are probably more alike than they care to admit. They just have different belief sets on what justice looks like and what they're willing to do to get what they want. I can't talk about the tricks in a season without mentioning Icy. The season delves into her character more than ever before, so if you haven't seen the season yet and don't want to hear spoilers about Icy, then skip ahead to the timestamp on the screen. We get an official backstory for Icy this season. I'm sure it probably creates inconsistencies within the Winx universe, and I'm sure it isn't a crowd pleaser for everyone, but I actually kind of enjoyed Rainbow exploring her character. This version of Icy is a princess from the planet of Diamond. One day, an evil witch attacked her kingdom, cursing her younger sister to a fox form and freezing the entire kingdom. Icy vows to become an even stronger witch than the one who destroyed her kingdom, so that she can return everything to normal. She styles her hair to remind herself of her sister that she lost, and models her personality and even magic off of the witch who took everything from her. Personally, I think they could have gone without making her a princess. We have too many princesses in Winx Club. But I like the overall idea for this backstory. It makes Icy a perfect foil for Bloom. They have very similar beginnings, but Icy chose to become like the evil that she loathes so much in order to take back what's hers. Whereas Bloom distances herself as much as possible from the evil witches who attacked Domino and does her best to be kind to everyone. It's a nice character parallel, and it was interesting to see a more vulnerable side to Icy. I don't think it diminishes her evilness or makes her less frightening as a villain. Though Icy has good reasons, she still went out of her way to do horrible things to get what she wants, and she definitely loses sight of her goal and coasts on being both psychotic and pure evil. Once again, I'm sure not everyone was a fan of this backstory, but at least Rainbow tried something new and interesting. I can appreciate that much. Before closing this video, I want to defend Rainbow a bit for the decision to market towards a younger audience for Winx Club. I'm not happy about it either, but it does make business sense. To start, I'm going to pull up a comment made by Eugenio Straffi, the creator of Winx Club. In the last 10 years, the animation audience has skewed younger. Nowadays, it's very difficult to get a 10-year-old to watch cartoons. The fans of the previous Winx Club say on social media that the new seasons are childish, but they don't know that we had to do that. What Straffi says is actually 100% true, as hard as it may be to believe for some. Animation aimed towards a preschool to elementary school audience is what performs best today. We're no longer living in a cable-focused world. Most of us today watch our favorite shows and entertainers through platforms like YouTube, Hulu, or Netflix. And guess what's the most watched content on YouTube? Content geared towards preschoolers. Six of the top 10 most viewed YouTube videos are aimed towards young children. If you add up all the views from these six videos, it amounts to 35 billion total as of February 2022. The biggest of these titans is Coco Melon, which is currently the number two most subscribed to channel on YouTube. Number two. I'm not joking, and I kind of wish I was. To put that into perspective, Cocomelon is ahead of a lot of the biggest names out there, like PewDiePie, Blackpink, MrBeast, and Justin Bieber in terms of subscribers. Let that sink in for a moment. And what do all these views equate to? Money! According to Screen Rant, Cocomelon as a brand earns about $120 million a year without merchandising. Its net worth is estimated at $386 million as of January 2022. This is nothing for animation companies to scoff at. And it's not just YouTube either. Cocomelon recently broke a record by remaining in Netflix's top 10 most watched shows for 62 days. It beat Avatar The Last Airbender, an animated show geared towards an older audience. Money talks. Companies are businesses, after all, and they need to earn money or they'll fall under. And the numbers are quite clear. Younger children's programming is where the money is. 
That's why Rainbow and many other animation studios have been creating content geared towards that age demographic in recent years. Winx Club is just one of the many victims of this new phenomenon, but at the very least, the creators haven't completely abandoned older fans. Though a flop, Netflix's Fate the Winx Saga was supposed to remedy the situation. Luckily, World of Winx did a better job at pleasing most older fans, and Rainbow claims that the next season will be for old school fans. I sincerely hope that that's the case, because even in this latest season of Winx, I can feel the appreciation of nearly 20 years of Winx in it. There are little bits of fan-pleasing moments throughout the season. Enchantix makes a comeback. Kiko, Nut, and Riven are back. Whiskas is helpful to the plot towards the end. Valtor, the most popular villain, was brought back as well. And past events are referenced, like Riven being manipulated by Darcy in Season 1, and Stella uses Kiko as a body double, similar to how the Winx would sneak out in Season 2. Obviously, it's far from a perfect product, but I'm still glad that I gave it a chance, and I now have some hope for the next season. If you've been putting off Season 8 like I have, then maybe you'll give it another chance? Personally, I'd recommend skipping to when the tricks join in on episode 14, purely because I really don't like Obscurum, and it focuses more on the winks and the tricks from that point on. But the choice is yours. Hope you enjoyed the video. Let me know what your thoughts on season 8 were. Regardless of whether you loved or hated it, I'd love to hear more about what other fans thought. If you'd like to watch me discuss more shows like Winx Club, as well as underrated shoujo anime, then please subscribe so you can follow along for the ride. The next video I'll be putting up will be talking about a hidden shoujo gem, Princess Tutu. But after that, I'll be making another Winx video. Not sure what it will be about yet, either a best of Winx for Roxy, or another mythological influences in Winx. Guess it'll be a surprise. Hope you'll look forward to it. Don't forget to keep the magic in your life. Till next time.